Hello to everyone out there and welcome back to my podcast. This is Natalie Silva with Life Choices and Golden Moments. Today I'd like to share a story with you all about love. It's been said that love is mysterious, yet it's plain and simple. We cannot live by bread alone. That's very true. We also need love in our lives. Because without love, abundant love, unconditional and transcendent, we would surely fall to pieces. This is such a story today about love. And it's titled, The Woman Who Couldn't Cry. And the story is authored by Susan Holliday Biadre. By the time I turned 22, I was pretty much of a snob. I was mainly interested in good times. Appearances meant a great deal to me. In evaluating possible dates, I can remember confiding to my friends, he's not tall enough or I don't like the color of his hair. Blondes are my type. My Bowie friends also had to be athletic because I was crazy about sports. A new bowling ball was helping me edge up toward a 200 game. In high school, I played on a girls' football team. The pace of my life accelerated after I finished school. Knowing I'd get bored sitting behind a desk in an office, I took a job in an aircraft factory. I was on my feet all day helping the mechanics, and I loved it. My spare time was devoted to twirling around dance floors, watching ball games, played by my company teams on weekends, and vacationing in Europe. Oh, I went to church too, but that was mostly because I had gotten into the habit and liked to be around the other young people who also attended. On Sunday morning in June 1969, I walked out of my apartment, climbed into my car, buckled my seatbelt, and headed for church. I really didn't remember getting into the car. However, I don't even remember going to bed the night before. My knowledge of the events of that day come from my family and newspaper accounts that I read later. I was driving toward the Boulevard Park Presbyterian Church. It was about a half a mile from my apartment. As I went through an intersection, a car driven by another young woman sped toward me. I had the right of way, but that was little consolation for what happened next. The other driver slammed into me broadside on the passenger side. I was wrenched from under the seatbelt and thrown free of the car into a rocky wall on the side of the road. For the next three and a half months, I was in a coma, suffering from multiple fractures and internal bleeding. I needed electric shocks to keep my heart beating, and in one day I received a transfusion of 11 pints of blood. If Susan does live, the doctors told my parents, you should be prepared to see considerable brain damage. At best, they suggested, I would likely be a physical cripple and mental vegetable. But I guess God had other ideas. For some medically unexplained reason, I pulled out of the coma mentally alert. But even though my mental powers were intact, my body had undergone a radical change. I had lost about 40 pounds, and I couldn't speak, and I was unable to stop my legs from involuntarily thrashing against the hospital bed railings. For several days, I kept thinking that I must be having a long nightmare, that I'd soon wake up and find I was the same old Susan Holliday. Then I'd blink and blink again, but the white hospital room was still there. Screams of frustration welled up inside me. I've got to say something or even moan or grunt. I think as I strained my throat and moved my lips, but no sound came out. A month of desperately attempting to mutter just one syllable passed, and the maddening silence still held me. The doctors were pessimistic. They told me because of the damage of my vocal cords that I probably wouldn't ever speak again. Emotionally and physically drained, I finally decided to try prayer. Then I discovered that I didn't know how to talk with God. I fell back on an example I remembered from the Bible. All day long, I repeated in my mind the first two words of Psalm 12. Help, Lord. Help, Lord. Help, Lord. 
Dozens, hundreds of times that day, I turned those words over and over in my thoughts. Finally, that very evening, God responded. As I sat outside my room in my wheelchair, I saw my doctor at the nearby nurse's desk, and I somehow softly rasped my first words in more than four months. <clears throat> Hello, Dr. Nelson. From that wonderful moment on that incredible power of simple prayer became an everyday reality to me. Hardly an hour went by when I didn't talk to God about something. As I slowly learned to speak again, I found my vocal cords wouldn't always work. The words were there in my head, but by the time they had passed through my throat to my lips, the sound was often unintelligible, slurred, croak, or grunt. And because I could only manage one monotone syllable for each breath, it was hard to find anyone with enough patience and imagination to sit around and absorb what I was trying to say. Finally, friends from my church and members of my family did their best to communicate with me. But of them all, John Beaudry, a young man I'd known slightly from high school days, became my most concerned and understanding companion. He surprised everyone by continuing to visit me almost every day. He'd come into the room and, like a big friendly bear, plant a brotherly kiss on my forehead. Then he'd say quietly, How you feeling? Although I usually had to repeat each sentence several times to others, John seemed to comprehend every word and everything immediately. We talked about trivial things. I can't remember most of the conversations, but I can recall clearly how those tender brown eyes of his would search my face. In a way, he seemed almost unaware of the seriousness of my injuries. He made it clear he regarded them as temporary problems. It was always, when you go back to work or after you get back on your feet again, his confidence in my recovery was infectious, and I began to find myself thinking the same way. For some reason I couldn't explain at the time, I began to look forward to our comfortable visits more and more eagerly than any party or athletic event I'd known before my accident. Still, I wasn't prepared for his words one afternoon, soon after my late November discharge from the hospital. He came into my room at home and looked very serious, and he said, I love you, Susan, and I want to marry you. My ears started ringing, and I caught my breath and shut my eyes. He had never hinted at romance, except for those little pecks on the forehead. He'd never even kissed me. For a few moments I was silent as conflicting thoughts rushed in and out of my mind. More than anything else, I had always wanted to get married, but since the accident and gnawing feeling had made me doubt whether any suitable young man would ever want to take responsibility for someone with injuries and disabilities like mine. Confused and upset, I responded lamely. I can't begin to be sure right now, John. Give me some time to think. Thinking and praying became my primary occupation during those next two weeks. The accident may have changed me on the outside, but God was changing me even more radically on the inside. Even if I had wanted to, I knew I could no longer judge a person by his face or hair color. John's loving nature obviously made him someone special. Finally, I said yes. Then things began to happen so fast that I could hardly keep pace with them. Strength slowly returned to my weakened arms and back as physical therapy taught me to roll over, sit up, and crawl. And as summer approached, all my attention turned to preparations for the wedding. Our church was packed that July day in 1970 when my dad rolled me down the aisle in my wheelchair. It was a beautiful wedding, and a lot of eyes were wet, but not mine. You see, another side effect of my accident was that something had gone wrong with my tear ducts. I couldn't cry. And as I embarked on my challenging but frequently frustrating new career as a handicapped housewife, I often wished I could fall back on the emotional release that tears can provide. One day, not long after we were married, I was sitting by the stove watching some meat simmer 
when I suddenly realized I had forgotten to add sauce. I unlocked the brakes on my wheelchair, tediously wheeled myself to a cupboard, locked the brakes again, then shakenly stood to get the sauce. Then I slowly reversed the routine to get back to the stove, hoping all the time the meat hadn't burned. At the same time, a pot of water started to boil over, and yet I could only watch it helplessly as I struggled with rising despair to have positioned my wheelchair in front of the stove again. Peeling a potato sometimes took five minutes or more. Peel, pause, peel, pause, pick up the dropped potato. Cleaning our house was an even more humbling experience. I would slide to the floor from my wheelchair and crawl as well as I could, dragging the vacuum cleaner behind me. Making the bed was another major project. Sometimes I'd collapse into a heap on the floor, overwhelmed by physical handicaps. Unable to cry, I could feel the emotions boiling up inside until I thought I was about ready to explode. But God was always there, and he supported me and relieved my anxieties when I prayed. Lord, I'm so frustrated. Please help me. Give me a sense of peace, a confidence that your will is being done in my life. John's faith helped me, too, as he watched me try to bring a bowl of salad to the table one evening in my wheelchair. I could see he was quietly confident that I was eventually going to make it. I had dropped the bowl before, and he knew I might drop it again, but he he didn't pity me. He had the wisdom to be just firm enough to make me try to do things on my own instead of trying to do everything for me. After I had placed the bowl carefully on the table, he said, I knew you could do it. The affectionate look on those brown eyes, the eyes I had thought would have to be blue, helped me understand how deeply he loved me despite my physical limitations. It gave me the incentive to try to clear the next obstacle and the next and the next. Gradually, strength and flexibility began to return to my legs and increase in my arms. I found that I could hobble along halting behind a walker, then walk by leaning against a wall for support. Before long, I was able to carry large bowls with both of my hands. But most wondrous of all, despite the predictions of all the medical experts that I could never become pregnant, I did. Our daughter, Janie, was born a year and a half after our marriage, and not even the painful pregnancy I endured could cast a shadow over the joy I felt when I looked into her sparkling blue eyes and fondled her soft hair. As I was recuperating from that delivery, John gave me a little book called How Much I Love My Wife. The sense of my blessing overwhelmed me as I sat there holding that volume. And suddenly, for the first time in more than two years, I cried. Not tears of frustration, but tears of total joy. I know now that the car accident that I thought had ended my life was the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm a different person, and all the changes have been for the better. Whenever I start to get blue, I think about the miracles God has performed in my life. I'm alive. I'm speaking much better, and I'm very much in love with the father of our own beautiful daughter. I seldom need a wheelchair or any other support to walk, and I see the marked improvements in my condition almost every day. All of that has been the result of trusting in prayer. I truly have cause to shout the Psalm 40. Thou hast multiplied, O Lord, my Lord God, the wondrous deeds and the thoughts toward us, None can compare with thee. This is Natalie Silver. I hope you enjoyed our story today. And will join us again next time for Life's Treasures and Golden Moments, where we'll share another story with you. Until then, take care, may God bless, and may you have a beautiful week.